Well, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Ooh, I think lots of people can hear me. So I am just so honored to be here. And with all of you, this is so great. It's a wonderful conference. I already spoke to some of the speakers, and I'm learning already, which is really great. So I'm going to take you through a number of things. Uh, the story that I'm going to talk about is how you should plan your life to achieve your purpose and to reach for the stars and never give up. So let's go through a little bit how I've lived this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal and professional journey. As you heard, I grew up right in Center Reach. I went to Center Reach High School. Uh, my grandparents brought me up, and my grandfather was a plumber on campus here. My grandmother was a cafeteria lady here. And my brother worked on the medical center when it was just a shell and looked like it was part of Star Wars. Um, and so uh, I have a lot, of, uh, a lot of connections to this community, uh, and I'm really delighted to be back. Then I'm going to talk about um, Internet of Things, blockchain, a couple of technical things, because one of the patterns that I see, even though I have all these cool things I've done, you know, I'm a mechanical aerospace engineer, I'm a rocket scientist, I worked at NASA, Grumman, I was a VP and SVP, blah, blah, blah. People still look at me like, what could you possibly know? Seriously? So what I'm going to do is share some of the things that you'll be able to talk about at cocktail parties and in your office soon, about blockchain and IoT and all these things. But to encourage you, too, that when you get the opportunity to share what you know, make it clear that any of us can know any of this stuff and do any of this stuff, because that's really what diversity and inclusion is about. When we look at someone that's not like us, to accept them. Assume that they know this stuff and assume that they can learn it. And that's one of the challenges that I think we have overall on the planet. Um, then I'm going to talk about some of the critical success factors for work, life, and leadership that I've learned, and then we'll go from there. And this is the chart that needs, uh, this is what I call my Florence Gump chart. Um, all these important people and me. How did this happen? Who knows? Uh, so on the top left is uh, my family. And uh, those are my brothers and sister, also known as my uncles and my aunt, because the picture right underneath that is with my grandmother, who was my mother. So um, I was, someone here, um, people work at Mather. There are some people who have worked at Mather Memorial Hospital. So I was born at Mather. Uh, my mother died the day I was born. Um, and my father left. And I never met him. And I just found out uh, about a year and a half ago that he passed away. And so that's that. You know, my, my daughter, who's a psych major, you know, they look you like in the eye like this, right? You know, so <laughs> she was like enamored with this thing. She had to do a family tree. I'm like, oh, man. And then there's this hole. And I'm like, oh, here we go. You know, so anyway, she, she's talking to me like a year and a half ago. I'm on the couch. You know, it's at night. I'm about to fall asleep. Bad time to talk to me. And my brain is gone. And she says, I want to show you something. And she pulls a chair up. I'm lying on the, the love seat. I'm short, so I can just stretch out on the love seat. And she's like right here, looking in my eyes like this. And she shows me his obituary. And I look at it, and she said, that's him, isn't it? I said, yeah, that's him. And she said, how does that make you feel? <laughs> Seriously, I gave birth to you, and this is how you treat me. Um, and I said, well, I feel sad. It was my father, and now I'll never meet him, right? Very interesting. So the reason I share this is that we all have stuff. We all have stuff in our lives, stuff that's happened, stuff that will happen. But we all have it, but it doesn't have to stop you from being how great you can be. Don't, don't be a victim. Be, you know, rise above it. Think of, you know, not the past, but the future. And that's one of the other things I want to share is I get invited a lot now that I'm old and they have Women's History Month, like, oh, let's get an old one to talk about the history of women. <laughs> okay, here I am. I just need to bring my cane next time. And, uh, <laughs> right? You know, I say there should be like a statue with pigeon poop of me on it somewhere. I don't know where yet. Uh, but what I really want us to think about is the future. What's the future of women? What's the future of women and men working together? Women, men, transgender, robots too. You know, we're going to be accepting robots. Talk about diversity and inclusion. Man, that's going to be difficult, right? So we really have to think of the future and how we can develop a great future. And so always be optimistic. And like I said, you know, my, my first day was, I talk about the speed bumps in life. I had a big bump day one, you know, right off the bat, day one. Um, and you just have to keep going. And my grandparents who brought me up were just incredible. I'm very, very fortunate. Uh, my brother lives in Selden. Uh, my sister's in Bayshore. I'm going to see her this afternoon. Uh, my other brother's in California. Uh, that's me and my husband, uh, my BFFs from IBM, and one of the mentors that I had, uh, Nick D'Onofrio. He was absolutely incredible. 
executive vice president, CTO at IBM. He still keeps in touch with us. And I believe a lot in mentoring and coaching and stuff. And he mentored all of uh, my, my other two girlfriends who are all retired IBM VPs. And he kind of aimed us at each other. And it's great, because now we have women's dinner, ladies' dinners every couple of months. And we told him we had these ladies' dinners. And he goes, oh, and you don't invite me? So we said, well, you know what? We'll promote you to lady and invite you. And so twice a year we do, and he buys really expensive bottles of wine that we can't afford, so it's a lot of fun when he comes. Um, but he's always there for us still, like when I'll say, you know, I'm thinking of getting on corporate boards. What do you think? Great idea, Florence. I'm looking at this job or that job. Hmm, watch out for this. Nick, when you think about me, what's unique about me? And that's a really great thing to ask people who are your mentors and coaches. When they think about you, what's your unique value add? Because we all have it. You know, and so uh, my brother, uh, who's a piece of work, Charlie, who lives in Selden, he called me uh, from, believe it or not, he was like in his 60s. He calls me from California. He's with his high school buddies, and they, we kind of revert. So he calls, and they call, and they say, hey, Flo, we know you knew the answer to this question. Like, you know when you roll down the windows, and it goes, blah, 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 blah. Why is that? You're a rocket scientist. I'm like, seriously? I'm at work, and you called me? OK. So I tell them why. And I said, anything else I can help you with? And so one of his friends says, oh, yeah, well, we have you. What's the meaning of life? I said, OK, I'll tell you my answer. I happen to have one. Um, our job while we're here is to determine the unique gifts that God gave us and to use them for good every day. That's your job. And so always do that. And you're going to gain new gifts. You'll create new gifts you know, as you make children or other things that you do and projects and work that you do. And so always do that. Always think of how you can make things even better. And Nick helps us do that. But what's important is he could tell me what was unique and great about me. And that's important from a senior executive at IBM. Right? I had other people look at me. So ask that question of people, um, which would be really valuable. Then I do a lot of Princeton, my alma mater. That's Chris Eisgruber, the president. Sonia Sotomayor. How inspiring is Sonia? Have any of you ever seen her speak? She's incredible. God bless her. So she went to Princeton as well. And uh, she tells a very interesting story. Um, she, she went to actually a Catholic school in the Bronx. One of my girlfriends was her teacher. And she said, you know, I saw Sonia Sotomayor became a Supreme Court justice. And I ran up to the attic and got the yearbook thinking, how many Sonia Sotomayors could there be? And sure enough, it was her. You know, I'm like, oh my gosh, how cool. So Sonia talks about her diversity and inclusion opportunity as she was looking at colleges. Very brilliant. One of her friends said to her, are you looking at the Ivies? And she said, what's that? You know, she, no one, she was the first to go to college in her, her family. So she figured it out. What are the top three? She says, OK. So she applied. And of course, she was called for an interview at each one. She's incredible. And she talks about the experiences she had at each one and how she felt when she got there. And it was at Princeton where she went, and um, there were some friends of hers. She was able to stay up, you know, speaking Spanish with her friends all night, feeling very at home, getting their perspective. And that's where she went. The other two schools felt very cold to her, and they weren't her culture. Very interesting. So what you do also is you look for places you feel good. But when you're one of the leaders, you make the place feel good for people. Right? That's what you do. And part of what you have to do is not just listen to what they say, but listen to what they don't say. Look for when they're uncomfortable. I speak a lot with electrical engineering, computer science, engineering um, professors. I was with one a couple of weeks ago, Lehigh University. And he said, what can I do to make more women feel more comfortable in engineering and computer science? I said, well, listen to them. But also look for when they're not doing what you think they would normally do. Like, they're not speaking up. They're not very engaged. They're leaning back. They're not leaning forward. Why is that? Why aren't they engaging? And find out. And so that's the opportunity you have as well. And so always think of um, how you can benefit from these environments, but then how you can be part of the solution. Anyone can do that. I was speaking at John Jay College of Criminal Justice last week. Or am I, the cops still here? No, they might like this. And um, at the Center for International Human Rights. Whoa, what a place to have a women in STEM discussion, international human rights. I was like, ah, this is kind of crazy. But one of the guys got up, younger than I am, which isn't hard at this point, but he gets up and he says, um, you know, there was a woman I worked with two or three years ago, and she was very uncomfortable, and I didn't like the way she was being treated. And first I went, oh, that's great that you noticed that. That's great. Now someday, you can become a leader that changes that. Go become a leader, quick. 
Become a manager, become a supervisor, make a difference. And so always think of that, how you can actually make a difference for peers and for others. Uh, Professor Kahneman, anybody um, read anything from uh, Daniel Kahneman? He's Nobel laureate, um, Think Fast and Slow. Really good book, of course, okay, Melissa, very good. Star, you get a little star. Cognitive computing, um, when I was working on the Watson strategy for cognitive computing at IBM, we had him come into the research lab. Um, and he is really very incredible. So if you get a chance to read it, it's very cool because it's about thinking fast and slow, humans thinking fast and slow, but as computers become really smart, who's thinking fast and who's thinking slow? Whoa, completely different model and the ethics of that. Um, and then this is, this actually, I was salutatorian at Center Reach High School and this is when I was still there and I won a Grumman scholarship. This is me and Alan Bean who was an astronaut that your grandparents probably knew about. And um, we didn't have color newspapers yet. <laughs> so I just found this. I was just going through my grandmother's stuff a couple of months ago when I found this in her little book, in her little, like, you know, that the metal thing with the key that, you know, she kept, like, on her dresser. Yeah, very cool. So uh, that was me winning the Grumman Scholarship. I think they wanted to show diversity. They had, you know, another African-American young man, and they had a girl. I'm like, oh, why do you think we're here? He's like, oh, yeah, right? But anyway, but that's good. <laughs> but we won, right? We won, you know? And, uh, but I mean that we were in the picture. Um, but we won, and he was brilliant. Um, and a lot of them were. But they were really trying to make things more diverse and inclusive, but there's a lot more to do, as we know. This is Mae Jemison, who's incredible. Um, she's really quite tall. I didn't realize that, but I guess I'm quite short. And she is the first African-American US uh, female astronaut. She is incredible. And I was talking to her. I said, you know, I want a picture with you because I have a picture with Sally Ride. Those are the ones up there. Uh, you know, who's the first American female astronaut. And she told me that she actually, um, she actually ended up using Sally Ride's desk at NASA. They gave it to her, which is really very cool if you think about it, right? Very cool. How much respect do you have for that dynasty? What a cool dynasty that is. Um, another woman that, I mean, I think she's like a medical doctor, a chemical engineer. and I mean, she's like, seriously, like one human can do all this stuff by the time they're 25 or 30? Um, and then, you know, my family, my kids, God bless them, Sally Ride, Hillary. It would have been more important if she was president, but still a good picture. Um, we were on a Title IX panel together. Uh, Bonnie Dunbar, another American astronaut. <laughs> my daughter, I used to try to get my daughter to be an engineer. She's the one who was like, how do you feel? You know, she's a psych major. And I used to bring her all these SWE conferences, Society of Women Engineers. And so Bonnie uh, was another astronaut. And I was like, you know, we got invited to this special little cocktail party to see her. I'm like, oh, Kristen, hurry up. We're going to go meet another lady astronaut. She goes, oh, another one? <laughs> I already know lady astronauts. I was like, how cool is that, right? You know, like, oh, another Walmart? Seriously, they're all over the place, right? <laughs> but that's what you want it to be. You want that we're just all equal. You know, what's the difference? You go to a lady doctor, I go to a doctor. Like, who cares? You know, I care about her brain and what she's able to do, his brain and what he's able to do. Um, and so, and then my first mentor, Yvonne Brill, Brill, God bless her, I met her when I was in college and she was the mentor for our Society of Women Engineers section. And um, I would still go back and see her until she passed away a couple years ago. Um, and I would give her a hug. She was right outside of Princeton. I would stop by for a hug. Um, she actually won um, the Medal of Technology Innovation from President Obama just a few years ago, and she showed it to me the last time I saw her before she passed away. In her obituary in the New York Times, it said, um, first female rocket scientist in the United States. And then it also said, and she makes a great meatloaf. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And they were like, well, we interviewed her son, and that's what he said. So if there was a man who was the first rocket scientist in the United States, even if he made the best meatloaf on the pl if he created the recipe for meatloaf, <laughs> would that have been in the title of his obituary? No. It kind of neutralizes the impact, doesn't it? So what we need to do is really validate what we all do. You know, like I was at, um, on the panel, I was at a John Jay, they said, what do you wish more men would have done for you? during your career. And I said, validate, val validate, validate. Um, even my husband, you know, I say, you know, it would be great if every now and then you said just six words. I'm so proud of you, honey. That's all, those, those six words. He's a man of few words. That's why he married me. I do all the words, um, <laughs> as you can tell. Um, and so now he started, you know, saying it. I came home from John Jay and said, oh, this, uh, and he said, I'm so proud of you, honey. I'm like, 
oh, I didn't even have to put it on a card. This is great. Um, but do that for your friends. Do that for your family. Do that for anybody that you see that you think really, really needs it, because we need to believe in ourselves more. So that's a little, oh, and then this was so fun last week. Ah, I got to be at the closing bell on NASDAQ. Who would have thunk? How cool is that, right? So my girlfriend um, at the Society of Human Engineers, who's president, sent me an email like, hey, Flo, I know it's really late. It was like 9.30 the night before, and it was the big snowstorm day that it was supposed to happen, the one we had where it was like a mess, and all the trains stopped going to Westchester County where I live. Anyway, it worked out. And she's like, I can't make it because of the, the snow. Uh, could you go to the closing bell at NASDAQ? Where would you go? Ah, oh, are you kidding me? You know, my daughter's like, you're going to suck on the train. My son's like, when's that going to happen again? You know, risk taker, not risk taker. Uh, I was like, OK, I'm going to go with the risk taker. I'm going. I'll just bring a little bit of clothes. I can always stay with a girlfriend. Um, and I actually got home. But this was so cool. So it was for International Women's Day. And they had one of the undersecretaries of the UN, the woman in the middle. Um, and then that's the, the president of NASDAQ. White and black is really in, the white jacket with the black underneath. So anyway, there were a lot of people wearing that. So she was wearing that. Uh, I don't do that yet. I, I learned that day, all different ages, too, so it's very cool. Um, but we did that because they're trying to really look at how can we increase the leadership opportunity for women around the planet. You know, the UN has a number of initiatives to get women, um, to help women to be leaders more. So very, a lot of fun. So that's my new picture that just came from last week. So fun. Um, so it's cool to be a lady engineer. So this is about uh, my background. I mentioned I went to Center Reach High School right up the block. Um, I went to Princeton. I was very lucky to get in. And people told me, you know, I applied for this Grumman Scholarship. I'm like, I'll never win. You know, that, and that's how I go into it. I'll never win. You should apply. OK, I'll apply, you know. You should apply to MIT. I'll never get in. I got in. You should apply to Princeton. I would never get in. I got in. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so weird. You know, and I, I really didn't think, why me? Why, you know, but why not me? Right? And that's the thing you have to get to is why not me? And that's such a bump to get over, isn't it? Right? I heard there was a great discussion about it earlier today. You have to keep reminding yourself. And so that's what I do. Like, I'll, I'll say, I'll never. And I go, oh, you know, like, it's like I kick myself. Like, oh, wait a second. Like, physically, I almost move like that. Um, and so, and then I did executive education at Harvard and Columbia. I look good on paper, right? But I'm very uh, approachable. And so people think, since I'm nice, I can't be smart. So when I graduated from Princeton, um, two of the guys came up to me and said, hey, Flo, you got the wrong cowl. I had the engineering hood on which was a different color than the liberal arts hood. And I guess they figured I, I, don't, know, mas I don't know, basket weaving. I don't know what they thought I majored in. <laughs> and so it was because they just knew me from the parties on the weekend, because I'm a really good dancer. Um, I would always win at pool because I took a lot of physics. I mean, it's all action reaction, you know? <laughs> It's really, physics is a great base. They don't realize, you know, that a woman physicist is like really scary on the pool table. And I would win backgammon and everything, you know, but, but they didn't know that I was president of the Society of Women Engineers, chairman of the Engineering Council that ran the engineering school, president of the AIAA, which is the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and I won the top Beta Pi Prize. But they had no clue, because that was in the engineering school, and they weren't. So when they were like, hey, Flo, you got the wrong cow, I went like, I always have these puppy dog moments where I, my head goes like this, like, wow. And I said, no, that's OK. It's the right one. And so that, that's another message I want to share is that I have these two little rules. I always try to be gracious, and I always try to do what's right. I don't always make it. I've got to tell you, I'm a little Italian girl from New York. It's very hard to be gracious all the time. But I really try. And so I don't want to put people down when they feel that way. But the question is, how can we educate them? That it's OK. I didn't go into the whole thing like, are you kidding me? I'm blah, 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 blah. I just said, that's OK. It's the right one. But we have an opportunity to make everybody realize that we can all do all this stuff. So we really should do everything we can about that. I had a lot of fun work stuff. I started at, uh, they still do Grumman scholarships. I worked at Grumman and Beth Page and Calverton. I worked at NASA Jet, Jet Propulsion Labs, which is really fun. Um, and HP, IBM, Internet2. Now I'm on the editorial board for this cool thing, blockchain and healthcare today. I'll talk a little bit about blockchain technology. It's kind of new. Not really new. It's probably about eight or ten years old, but a lot of people are becoming more aware about it. And it can actually enhance what I call TIPS, trust identity, privacy, protection, safety, and security, which is really critical for medical record data sharing, very important for um, the Internet of Things, biomedical things. So I'll talk more about that. I also am special advisor for Next Generation Internet. Since I've done a lot of things with the Internet, I was senior vice president, chief innovation officer at Internet2, um, which did a lot of stuff with the Internet as well. Um, and so that's a lot of fun. And I'm actually um, leading the EU-US collaboration around Next Generation Internet 
technology and research, which is kind of fun. Um, and then I'm also editor-in-chief for a book on women and tips for IoT, which is this trust, identity, privacy, protection, safety, and security thing. If you want to learn more about that, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, but there's also a lot of stuff online. And then have fun on the way. Um, so one of the things I'd really suggest all of you do, how many of you have been on a board, like a Girl Scout board, a corporate board, any board? Perfect. Every hand should go up next time I come, if you invite me back, or next time I see you. Because having a board position, really, it looks great on your resume, and it teaches you a lot about leadership and how leaders make decisions. Like I said, even if it's a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout board, get on a board, learn you know, the process, get on um, any type of board in your community. You could go to, I know the first board I got on, I went to a local United Way office and said, I'm looking to volunteer. And they said, oh, well, these people need a board member. I'm like, well, that's a cool thing to volunteer for. You know? And so I would suggest that you do that. So I've done a lot of those things. Um, and I've also gotten a lot of cool stuff. Um, but I also did a TED Talk. Those are great opportunities. So have you had a TED Talk here at Stony Brook yet? OK, that's great. Keep doing those and highlight people. Um, and I've done a lot. Of, I was also a PI or uh, principal investigator on a couple of NSF awards, one on cybersecurity transition to practice that Melissa is doing some work on as well. Um, and I'm more published now. I, I was terrible at statistics. This is another message. I hated statistics. Nothing personal. Oh, God, this is going public. So I wasn't really good at it. And now I'm published in a handbook of statistics by Reed Elsevier. I'm like, are you kidding me? But anyway, it's on cognitive computing theory and applications. And I actually worked on the Watson strategy, which is cognitive computing at IBM, and the Internet of Things strategy. So I wrote a chapter on cognitive computing and IoT. So you can actually grow into being a leader in an area that you thought you stunk in, um, which is very interesting, right? Continue to be curious. Continue to believe in yourself. And keep going, is what I would say. But I was like, gosh, my professors would be rolling over in their desks right now if they knew about this. Um, and then some of the board uh, thing I, things I talked about. So now I'm going to be technical a little bit. I'm going to teach you some cool stuff that you can talk about at um, cocktail parties. And uh, people will be very impressed, go home and say, oh, I learned about blockchain today, honey, whoever your honey is, or your dog, or whoever will listen to you. Um, and so one of the things that um, we created with the IEEE, which is the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers. How many people familiar ever heard of IEEE before? Excellent. Very, very good. IEEE is the largest not-for-profit, God bless you, um, organization on the planet. They have over 423,000 members. And they're very well known for being great. They're nice nerds. They're really smart. They create things like 802.11, like networking um, standards and stuff. And we created, a, with an end-to-end -end trust and security for Internet of Things workshop, working with IEEE and the National Science Foundation, this framework called Tips for IoT. Why did we do this? Because there are a lot of issues with the trust of people or services or devices trying to get into your devices, right? Can you trust that, that person or that thing trying to access my stuff? That person from Amazon opening up my front door and then going into my house? Oh, sure, I trust them. What's your problem? So trust. And to trust them, what about their identity? How do you know who that really is or what that really is? What about privacy, privacy of data? It could just be data, your personal data. It could be financial data that you have on your laptop and somebody does a phishing attack and gets on your data. Or it could be HIPAA privacy. Protection, how do you protect people? How do you keep them safe? And what about security? So this is an area that we created that I'm trying to increase awareness about so we can all serve it better. And here are examples why. So when I think of the Internet of Things, I think of a couple of things. I think of vehicle hacking. And I'm not going to show the video today, but who's seen the, the, hap, the hack of the, the Prius or the Jeep on the road where they turn the engine off? Scary, right? Guys on a highway, they turn the engine off. Oh, yeah, not a problem. All that is doable. Um, who's heard about, and some people are here from the medical center, I think, who's familiar with the FDA announcement August 29th of 2017 that announced that there are 465,000 implanted pacemakers um, that are hackable? Anybody see that? Oh, OK, let me tell you a little bit about that. So um, they're hackable. So they need a firmware update. How many people know what a firmware update is? You guys are smart. How many people think their grandparents with a pacemaker know what a firmware update is? <laughs> Not that many, right? So this is how this would go in my family. I'm Italian, as I think I mentioned. Grandma, we have to get you a firmware update for your pacemaker. Hmm, a firmware. Uh, that's like uh, al dente. 
Kind of, yeah. It's between hard and soft. It's firm. Um, but, oh, that's close, Grandma. But we'll go to the doctor first, and then we'll stop for pasta on the way home. So who's going to help these people? You know, I'm thinking that there may be the need to create a new type of visiting nurse, or maybe all these kids becoming PAs, you know, physician's assistants, maybe they help with some of this digital, yay! Maybe they help with some of this digital stuff. We have to think about what are some of the, as Ginny Rometty, the CEO of IBM calls them, new collar jobs, not blue collar, not white collar, new collar. What are some of the new jobs that need to be created to enhance this stuff? To make sure that people know about trust and identity and privacy and protection, safety and security, and helping them to keep themselves safe. So that's very critical. There also, has, has anyone seen uh, the insulin pump hacks? So there are a couple of ads that have been done. Uh, actually, they were, they were news shows where a guy uh, hacks his own Medtronic insulin pump and then one on J&J. &J. So all this stuff is hackable. And also, the communication. We were talking about things like blockchain, which is a technology that um, allows you to keep better track of the data provenance of where data has been and where things have been. But the challenge is that, you know, when the data goes from one thing to another, how do you know the data wasn't changed before it got there? But then, like, when the insulin pump goes, oh, yeah, oh, oh, my gosh, the glucose level is way out of control. Let me, wait, you, wait a second, who told you that? You know, the devices should be working with each other, and that's what the blockchain allows you to do, is to keep track of this data. And if not everybody agrees that that's the data, then they take a look at it again. But we really have to try to keep this safe for people. And then someone was saying to us today, well, why would somebody do that? I don't know, why do, they, why do they fly planes into buildings? You know, why do they walk into schools with guns? Why? They do it, right? And there's evil, so we have to protect ourselves. And I always think of what can we be as the adult supervision? What can we do to make this better? Smart home hacking, they can hack into your house or just join Amazon. No, I shouldn't say it that way. Um, and then they can just come in for real. And then scientific data hacking. Some people will say, I have a very secure device. It is the only one on the planet. Nobody would bother. So did anybody uh, remember uh, the neutron stars that came together like a f last year? I don't know if you heard, yeah, okay. So anyway, there was a telescope in Australia that actually got hacked. They were trying to move it and they couldn't because somebody hacked the server. And they had to like race out there and fix things. So nothing is really safe is the point. So the question is what can we do to make sure we keep things and people safe? So my biggest uh, concerns are connected vehicles and connected healthcare devices because if you hack them you can quickly slip, kill somebody. Um, and, smart, and then they can be in smart cities, campuses, communities. So what I've started doing is working more with IEEE, and there's an IEEE Standards Association, and we actually had a meeting on blockchain for clinical trials, and I'm gonna be speaking at their WAMI conference. Doesn't that sound cool? I love when geeks make cool acronyms. <laughs> WAMI, and it's wearables and medical interoperability, and that's later in April um, in DC. And then next week I'll be speaking at GlaxoSmithKline in Philly, um, to, they have a fun ovation session. What a great idea. Fun ovation, isn't that cute? A fun innovation session. And it's going to be a debate, like a scholarly debate, you know, like pros and cons, for and against on blockchain and healthcare. Very interesting. So I'm looking forward to learning there too. But we should all think about how we can make things better. So someday, and it's already starting in some places, we're going to have these smart and connected communities and campuses. You'll have autonomous buses. You'll have all these medical devices that you already have across the street. Uh, but people will be wearing them in their offices or on campus. And all this stuff is going to be connected in, in somewhat of a mesh network. That's the way I see it. A lot of, some people don't agree with the mesh, but you don't have to get specific about the mesh. But a lot of these things are going to be interconnected. That's why they call them smart and connected communities. And the question is, how do you keep all this stuff safe? And somebody has to worry about that. So who's gotten to the point? I remember when I was young, I used to think, they are worrying about it. Anybody think that? Yeah. They're going to fix it. They. Who's realized that you are they? <laughs> All your hands should go up. You are they. You are. And so we have to do something about this. And that's what I encourage you to do. One of the really cool opportunities we've been discussing, I also um, work with a cancer informatics group, um, Cancer Informatics for Cancer Centers. They're having their meeting in Maui if you have the money first week in April. It could be a lot of fun. Um, but we've been talking about precision oncology and precision medicine, right? So how can we leverage all this data, the Fitbit data, the image data, the genomic data? They're, you know, petabytes, and someday they say brontobytes, you know, like a dinosaur, 10 to the 27th bytes, brontobytes of data. How do we leverage all this data to actually make the best decision for you, for me, for your mom, for your sister? 
And so that's going to require secure data sharing, worrying about this TIP stuff, which we think blockchain can be a part of, but there are many other things. In the device itself, we need what we call a defense in depth strategy, and the FDA has talked about this for a number of years. But this is where if you have a device like this, say this is a, an implanted, well this isn't implanted, so we won't say that. So let's say it's an infusion pump, right? So what you want um, is hardware, firmware, software, and service level security. So every time the bad guy gets through one la layer and they go, I'm in, they, get, they go, oh man, I can't believe there's another level of security. And you're like, yes, the geeks unite. And so that's what we have to do is make this very secure with a defense in depth strategy. Think of like a castle. You know, when they would like, you know, throw rocks, you know, and then there, you know, people, you have walls in a the castle. Then they would get up close and the bridge goes up and there's a moat. You're like, oh man, there's a moat. And then they go in the moat, there are alligators. Oh man, there are alligators. You know, so every time you get past one layer, you want another one. You want another layer of security and keep running faster than the bad guys. And so that will help us to create secure precision medicine, secure precision oncology, and to help us improve outcomes, patient outcomes. As we, I'm going for 100 years old, I don't know how many of you are. As we live longer, more stuff happens. You notice like your things hurt? Anybody at that stage? I get up in the morning, I say my things hurt, like all my things. <laughs> my husband's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I don't know, my knees hurt, my back hurts, my, I don't know, this hurts right here, you know, whatever. You know, and so there's a lot we need to do to try to make life better. Um, everyone becomes bionic, right? We, we change a lot of things. But we need to keep this all secure because we're gonna be more connected. So blockchain technology can help with clinical trials. As an example, what we talked about in clinical trials was the idea that you could have like a, a blockchain for the, the providers, the pharmaceuticals, the, the medical people, the insurance companies to share information about clinical trials, where you might want to do it, and then maybe have another public blockchain that would go out and find more patients to participate. How cool would that be? Because those who live in that world know that we don't have enough people doing the clinical trials, so we can't get to the right answers to improve the outcomes as quickly. Just to, you have to test it on real humans, right? And so there could be opportunities to leverage blockchain in many different ways. So now you can talk about it at a cocktail party, back at the office, and I'm a friend of Stony Brook, um, I'm Melissa's friend, and actually I've been a friend of Stony Brook my whole life. Um, so if I can help with anything, let me know. So now let's talk about diversity and inclusion a little bit more, and let's start talking about women. So for uh, women in STEM, I've always been a woman in STEM. Um, the way I got involved in this is my brother, who was my uncle, you, are you tracking, right? My brother, who's, you're all in? Okay. My brother, who's my uncle, Frank, um, he would, who's a geek, he has pocket protector still, love him very dearly. Oh, he's gonna see this. Love him very dearly. <laughs> And um, so he used to get me up to watch the Apollo missions. Anybody old enough to do that or your grandmother told you about that grandfather? Okay, so we used to get up to watch the Apollo missions take off. And they used to take off at like 5.30 or 6 in the morning, right? Who else would want to get up? I was three, what did I know? You know, so there I was with my Bugs Bunny doll. I love my Bugs Bunny doll. You pull it and say, what's up, doc? I loved it. And I would take it everywhere with me and I had my little patties, you know, my little pajamas. We would sit on the floor like in the Forrest Gump thing. And we were wa watching it and I remember thinking, oh, that's so cool. And then one day I vividly remember thinking, remember puppy dog moment, huh, how do they do that? How do they get up there? How do they get back safely? And they say that's the day you become an engineer when you start asking how. I was about three. And so I've always been this woman in STEM, always very different, you know, the only girl in advanced physics, the only girl who graduated with an aerospace engineering degree from Princeton my year, very small club as you can imagine. I'm, I'm used, to, but, I, but I was used to being different. Remember, I was born, my uncles were my brothers, my aunt was my sister, so it's like, boy, I'm used to complex problems. Not a problem, and I'm used to being different, right? So it's a pattern for me, I'm good, I'm fine. You know, I'm a rocket scientist and a cheerleader, and I had this one boss, he would say, that doesn't compute for me. I said, that's okay, it's me, you don't have to think about it. That's okay. You know, but that's, I, I was saying, I still have my Captain Flo, you know, Cougarette's uh, kick line letter at home somewhere. I should have brought it with me today. It must be in my yearbook somewhere. Um, but what happens is a lot of us either are not chosen or we just give up. You know, so if you look at it, the way I see it is that we need to get to human population parity. Or we're not leveraging all the resource we have on the planet, right? So if, if women and if men are half the population, they should be half of all roles. If women are half the population, they should be half of all roles. Nurses, teachers, engineers, doctors, astrophysicists, I'm flexible. You know, why should anyone get to stay home and do their nails or, or do wood cutting? You know, everyone should be out there working. So that's how I see it. And the question is, how can we change that? Because look at this, 57% of professional occupations are held by women. 26 of tech jobs, actually that's a little high for right now, it's probably more like 21%. 
19% of software developers, and these numbers are a little old, but they haven't changed. That's a sad thing. Um, and you can see about 5% of the Fortune 500 CEOs. Oh, what happens? Either we don't get chosen, or you know what happens? We give up. We give up. So let's talk about that. So we're losing what little diversity we have. So why do women leave, if you ask them? Sometimes they talk in code, and so we're going to talk about that. And sometimes they actually say how they feel. Um, they. Oh, I'm one of them. OK, so sometimes we talk in code. Sometimes we say how we feel. <laughs> Working conditions, no advancement, too many hours, low salary. No work-life balance. I make less than I should compared to the guys. I'm not going to say who. I, I talked to women today that still is experiencing that. Not good. A lot of us do. Working conditions, they don't treat me well. I'm not happy. But they say working conditions. You could think, oh my gosh, the desks aren't big enough. Oh, she has such a big footprint. She always brings her purse with her. Right? You know, you could look at this and misdiagnose it, <laughs> right? And that's the question is really to listen. Remember, hear what they're saying and what they're not saying. Work-life integration, I need more time with my family. Conflict with family or too much travel. I remember when I was first coming back from having my son, um, hopefully you won't get uncomfortable, and I was nursing. And they were like, oh, but you have to come back to this, this meeting. I'm like, why would, I, why would I have to fly to that meeting? Can I be on the phone and you can go? You know, and that was like not an option. You know, you're being insubordinate. I'm like, seriously? You know, and that, it's better now, but still, you know, be flexible, especially for good people. Um, they didn't like the work, lost interest, or didn't like the daily tasks. They make me do the garbage. I remember, you know, in one role I was an executive, I said, you know, I feel like Cinderella. I feel like Cinderella. Who's ever felt like Cinderella in their job? Yeah. And not even at home, right? A lot of time you feel like Cinderella at home, maybe. So the question is, how can we protect against that? How can we get out of this? Or the organizational climate, I, I didn't like the culture. They didn't like me, and I could tell, right? Or my boss or my coworkers, right? And everybody feels this way. It's not just women. But we have to think of how can we make this better? So some of the issue is um, unconscious bias. You know, when people look at me, and um, you know, I was at this um, NSF conference, actually, about a year and a half ago, and I went up to this guy who was doing a poster session, and I looked at, and he was all by himself like this, not by his poster. I said, oh, you look, I'd like to hear about your poster. I thought you, he didn't want to be, I want to be lonely. I want to think I really want to hear about his stuff. So he looks at me and goes like this. I'm like, what is that? And he said, uh, do you understand optimization? Another puppy dog moment. I said, I think I can handle it. Why don't you give me a try? So we go over to his poster, and he's showing it to me. And I'm thinking, he really needs to bring these two pieces together. I worked on the cognitive computing strategy. He's separating things he shouldn't. But he didn't say that. I'm listening. <laughs> and um, another man comes up who knows who I am. And um, meanwhile, I'm going to be in the main tent the next day. I told somebody else, I said, I can't wait to see his face. I said, I know, I know. But anyway, <laughs> um, so this other guy knows who I am. And so he says, um, so he's asking and they're talking, and then I looked at him and I said, you know, excuse me, don't leave and please don't be uncomfortable, but I need to ask this gentleman a question. He said, okay. So I looked at the gentleman, being very polite here, gracious, right? Um, and I said, why did you say that to me? And I didn't say another word until he answered. And he goes like this. And you can see him thinking, why did I say that? He might have been thinking, what did I say, right? But it's unconscious bias. Like, how could you possibly know this stuff? And he said, well, this other guy is an example. He came over and was asking me questions before. I said, so? I didn't say, well, I worked on the strategy, and I know what you're saying is wrong. You know, I didn't do that. I, you know, I try to be gracious. And so then I looked at the, the gentleman who had come afterward, and I said, do you understand what I mean? He goes, oh, yeah, unconscious bias. I'm like, oh, you got the memo. And so then this newer, older gentleman says to this other guy, she understands optimization and aggression and a lot more things than you'll ever understand. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> and so you can do that too. You can actually help and validate other people. Um, we're going to talk about another example for this. So this happens a lot in meetings where people diss what we say. This has happened to me a lot. Um, and so what happens? So we don't speak up. We're reluctant to take leadership positions. They'll never listen to me. I'm never going to be successful. Here we go again. Doubt, doubt, doubt. The doubt me's. Um, being overly harsh about their own work um, or discounting our own performance. You know, mine's not as good. So here's an example of something that happens. That's an excellent suggestion, Miss Triggs. Perhaps one of the men would like to make it. <laughs> now, this actually happens. 
right? And so who's heard the story or lived through? You make a recommendation. People total, don't even act like you said anything. And then a, God, look at all the heads nodding up and down. And then a little while later, one of the guys goes, I have this great idea. <laughs> and it's your idea. Who's ever seen that happen? Whoa! <gasps> you're an anomaly. No, you're not. You're part of the pattern. So this happens a lot. And so one of the things any of you could do, men, women, especially someone who has more power in the organization, whatever that means. They're a higher level. They're a guest speaker. So you don't have to deal with the internal politics because you get to leave. It's like being a grandparent, right? And so what you can do is mirroring. Who heard about the Obama administration? They started, the women started doing that for each other, the mirroring. Very good. And so what happens is, um, you know, Susie makes, makes a comment. And um, Ben, or Benita, we'll say Benita, I'm going to say it's another woman. She, uh, she notices everybody ignores what Susie said. And it's a good idea. So Benita says, while the other people are going off another time, she goes, Susie, that was a great recommendation you made about the infusion pumps. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, you just blew their cover. It's on the table with her name on it. Uh-oh. But it's a beautiful thing. Let's validate what she said. And actually, she probably has more great thoughts behind that one. If she brought it up, she's probably been thinking about this. Diversity of thought drives innovation. Help with that. Help each other. And so that's what I recommend you do is the mirroring so you don't have as much of this anymore. So next time I come, and if I do, or if you're at another event, have somebody ask, so who still sees that happening? I hope a lot fewer hands go up. And so the idea is, you know, diversity of thought. And one of the things that happened to me when I was at Grumman, remember, I was like, you know, co-captain of the kick line, Captain Flo, rah, rah. I wore pink. I still kind of do. Um, and I was a Grumman scholar. And, um, but I look like these guys' granddaughter. I know that. I wore a pink headband and cute little fluffy skirts. I could wear a poodle skirt if I could. I love stuff like that. And so I was working with these guys, and we were working on um, solar power satellites. And what we were going to do is we, we actually built a waveguide extrusion device. You know, like those Play-Doh things where you put the, and it comes out little pipes? That's like a waveguide extrusion device. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the idea. So you put the metal in, and chunk a chunk a chunk you get these waveguides out the other side. So we created a waveguide extrusion device that went into the payload bay of the space shuttle. We had a whole mock-up with the payload bay, and we had the extrusion device, and all this exciting stuff. And we were going to bring it up to LEO, low Earth orbit, and chunk a chunk a chunk we were going to make this, wave, this big solar power satellite and then shove it up to geosynchronous Earth orbit, which always bothered me, but I'll get to, get to that. But then we were going to have this big rectenna, a receiving antenna, out in the ocean. We were going to have this huge beam of energy a geosynchronous Earth orbit, so it should be synchronized with the geography, with the land, with this huge beam coming down to this little, you know, multi-kilometer rectenna. And so, anybody concerned about that? <laughs> so I was, you know, I wasn't all into the beauty of the technology and, oh my gosh, we can do this. I said, so what if, like, the beam gets a little off-center? They're like, oh, it's geosynchronous Earth orbit. I'm like, you know, but stuff happens. You know, what if like it got off center and it like fried the whales? And they're like, honey, don't worry, you're pretty little head about that. I'm like, ah, oh, them's fighting words. So I said, okay. Um, I didn't say that though. I was too young to realize I had, that I could think that way. And I said, well, what if you were in a plane and by mistake it flew through the beam? They're like, oh, oh, that gets very personal. So I had to kind of personalize it to see that they could be in pain, but still they ignored me. So then the EPA gets involved, and they're like, are you guys crazy? You can't do this. So I wasn't in that meeting, as you can imagine. I was a little dweeb. And so then they're talking to me later on, and I find out. I'm like, oh, imagine that. And I don't say anything, you know. And so then the next project comes up, and this is really funny. I vividly remember this. One of the engineers came up to me with the paper and went, uh, what do you, what do you think about this? <laughs> like I was going to bite him. Um, but you know what? I was so proud of him. Because what did he learn? He learned diversity of thought that summer. And he ingested it and digested it and then started living it. Oh, I remember after that summer, I kept saying, I am so proud of these guys. And people were like, are you kidding me? After they treated you like that, I said, but look at what they learned. They learned diversity of thought. So help them learn. Help them learn. And then validate when they do. I was like, oh, I'm so glad you asked. And then they're like, oh, I don't want to hear it, la, 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 you know, but that's okay. It was a really good step in the right direction. And we can continue to, to um, encourage that. 
And so what do we all do to be part of the solution, or POTS as we call it, part of the solution? Um, so lead with words and actions, be inclusive, welcome a diverse team, expect diversity and inclusion. It's just like inspect, expecting, why'd you leave your socks on the floor? You have to pick up your socks before you go. You expect stuff, right? I expect you to be nice. I expect you to do this. I expect you to do your job. Um, and so that's very important as you build this culture of diversity and inclusion. Support networks, support events like this, establish policies and, me and um, measures, correct bias um, and lack of inclusivity. And it should be everybody. You know, so I, I often tell people, like if I meet someone, they say, so did he have a beard? And I'm like, I don't know. But he's a neuroscientist. And we were talking about, you know, leveraging the Internet of Biomedical thing is to blah, blah, blah. People are like, but did he have a beard? I'm like, as if I care. You know, like I remember the insides of people a lot more than the outsides, very honestly. And if we all thought more like that, we might be more inclusive. Um, but I look for the content. And there was a guy that worked for me years ago, and he always, he'll leave it on Facebook. This was like 15 or 20 years ago. And he was like, it's all about the content. He still says that to me on Facebook sometimes. I'm like, oh, I feel like such a geek. But it is, you know, how can we work together to make things better is what I would encourage. And so think of the ways that you can have these discussions. You know, make diversity and inclusion discussions less risky. I did a presentation like this at another university on the other side of the country in a room that was like two or three times as big. It was gigundo. And while I was talking about this, it's not the way it feels here, it started feeling kind of cold and prickly. Like people were uncomfortable with the discussion. And I could feel it. And so I actually, you know, I tend to be a little too direct sometimes, I said, oh, it's getting cold and prickly in here, isn't it? I don't know, how do you guys feel? And they were like, you know, <laughs> that wasn't my hand in the cookie jar. I was like, okay, well, you know, part of the opportunity is just to start thinking about it. Would it make things better? What more could we do together if we felt this way? And the next day, they didn't kick me off campus, and uh, I was there, and I saw a couple of the, the executives, the, the leaders that were in the meeting, and from different parts of campus, it wasn't in the same meeting, and uh, both of these two people, two men said to me, you know, the first topic of discussion the team brought up this morning was your presentation from yesterday. I said, really? What did they say? they started talking about the issues. It made it real, and it gave them permission to talk about it. I was like, wow, that's great. That is great. Think of all the great things that could come from that and help them get there. So, you know, make it less risky to talk about this stuff, and it's from everybody's perspective. Uh, men, women, you know, all sorts of, of challenges and opportunities. We, many of us feel different in many situations. When I was at the Society of Women Engineers, it's a conference with 12,000 women engineers. I love it, it's my peeps, right? And a lot of our peeps. But we also have um, panels on men as diversity partners and allies. And so we bring a few good men in. Men are allowed to join the Society of Engineers, by the way, that you could, any, anybody could go join today. Um, and so we had one of the VPs from IBM who was there, really great guy, really very good. And uh, he's from research, and we're walking around, he has like, I call him the IBM harem, we're like all surrounding him, we want him to feel comfortable and happy, you know, like, oh, how you doing, Dave? He's like, oh, I'm fine. And we're walking along, and all of a sudden he goes like this. I said, are you okay? Um, you know, listen for what they don't say and how they're acting. He said, yeah. I said, we're trying to make you feel welcome. Um, we're, we're so delighted you're here. He said, I know. I said, so what's wrong? He said, uh, I feel different. Oh. I said, really? And he looked at me, and I might cry, I'm Italian, I get emotional. And he said, um, this must be how you feel every day. Oh. I nearly started crying, really. And then he said, does it get better? And I said, no, you get used to it, right? It would be great if we didn't have to get used to it. Um, but it's, it was really very motivating. Melissa and I both know another gentleman who went to that conference. And he's really a great guy, and he's adorable. At first he was like, where are you, where are you? I'm all by myself. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a, they're really very nice. Just talk to them, you know? <laughs> and so then I go, found, I found, he's like, where are you? Like, I'm outside this room. I don't know if I'm in the right place. I'm like, it's okay, I'll find you, you know? And so we start talking, and he's on this panel. And afterward, he said, this has been a life-changing experience for me. 
right? He's never been surrounded by like 12,000 women engineers and scientists and computer scientists and all this stuff. And he was so inspired, and he still talks about it. It's really cool. I think he's probably mentioned it to you, Melissa. Very exciting. So let's go into each other's groups and do great things with each other, you know, and make it all one big group. So what have I learned? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So first of all, I say plan your life to achieve your purpose. Figure out what you want out of life and go for it. Um, most of us are at that age that you get to do that. Sometimes if your parents are still paying for college, they get to do that, but that's another story. But, um, but you know, figure out what you're trying to do. Make sure you create the plan to do it. We had this little process I'm going to show you quickly called GROW. Uh, set your goals, assess your reality, look at your options, and then figure out what are you going to do about it um, that you could do with yourself. Believe in yourself, especially when others don't believe in you. When I was at IBM, we actually created this little mantra called IBM, I believe in me. It matched so well. Um, and we created it. We were in Korea at the International Conference of Women Engineers and Scientists, and another woman, from uh, a researcher, said, they're just like us, Florence. Like, what does that mean? She's like, none of us believe in ourselves. It's all over the planet. I'm like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And so we created this little podcast series, and people could download it, like two, three minutes. And, and I had people from all over the planet saying, oh my gosh, I download these, listen to them on the subway while I'm driving to work, a lot of fun. You could do something like that. Um, and after a speed bump, be on your side. I had this person who was trying to create her my career. It was really terrible. And he was pretty successful. And I kind of fell on the floor in a puddle, like crying in my bedroom honestly. And uh, my daughter looked at me and said, Mommy, why are you on his side when everybody else is on your side? Out of the mouths of babes, huh? So look for the personal cheerleaders in your life that are going to help you through that. Um, mentors, you know, family, friends. Follow your instincts, including living your values. If somebody tries to change your values and they're successful, you're the one that gets broken after they leave. So be careful about that. It might be what you like, but maybe not. Build your skills, collaboration skills, leadership, communications, technical, business, financial, the whole thing. And find ways to do that. Um, you know, somebody and I were talking earlier today about going to Toastmasters, learning how to present in front of a group. In my church, I'm very involved with church. Remember, I kind of, I came into the world very alone, so I look at it like I have me and God, and that's about it. Everything else is a cherry on top or icing on the cake. So I'm very involved in church. Um, not everybody is like that, but they actually have a junior lecture program. I had both of my kids at like 10 years old, lecturing in front of the entire congregation. And they're both great public speakers now. Um, so find places that are safe. Like, that's a lot of people, but you can't mess with the material, right? It's the Bible. Don't change the words. <laughs> so you don't, you don't have to prepare the content at all. It's there. You just have to learn how to pronounce all this stuff, right? And they have little pronunciation books. I have one of those, too. Um, so practice it. Now, this is my life plan. I created it um, in 1983. I know it's hard to read. I'll show you a PowerPoint version, but I still have this. Um, any good engineer from years ago, you use graph paper and a pencil, so that's how I created this. And I updated it over time. I had a career line, a life line, um, like a money line, a family line, different lines of what I had to do. I figured out when I was going to have kids and I added 18 years and said I need $250,000 per kid to put them through college. That's what engineers and project management, we do stuff like this. And then I, you know, remember my, my grandfather, God bless him, was a plumber. My grandmother was a cafeteria lady. I didn't know what an executive was. What's that? You know, I get into IBM, they're like, you're an executive resources. So I'm like, oh, what does that mean? You know, and then they explain it to me, and I'm like, what's, I still didn't get it. What's an executive? I don't get it. He's an executive, so what makes him different? So anyway, there was a woman that my husband worked for, and she became a director, which was an executive, and she looked like me. We both had like a Dorothy Hamill hairdo, and you know, we were both the same size. I was like, oh, I look like her. Maybe I can do that too. And then I became a director, and then I became a VP, and that was the end of my line. I'm like, uh-oh, what do I do now? And so then I created an extension. Um, and that's the line up there. And I've done actually most of that now. I was a senior vice president and a C-level executive in Internet 2. I was in academia. Um, the thing that's left is CEO, so I'm available. In case I'm <laughs> um, so, and then this is the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, version, which was a freelance version for people old enough to remember that. Um, and we had Lotus at IBM. Career line, family line, money line, community line. And then I, you know, what's next? I get to, I get to keep going forever. Why not? Right? Why not? And so here are a couple of tools that um, I use kind of virtually in my brain. One is the work life pie or school life pie, depending. Um, I speak at middle schools, too. <laughs> I did that in middle school, the Cornelia Connolly Center downtown in Manhattan. And then all the girls ran into a, a room with whiteboards and drew their, their one pager, their, their chart, their life chart. How adorable is that? Very cool. 
Um, and so when you look at how you're spending your time and you feel unbalanced, like look at how you're spending your time and I say, you know, you get one pie. This isn't like a coupon, two pies and a liter of Diet Coke for $24.95. <laughs> you get one pie, there's 24 hours in a day and that's it. So you look at how you're spending your time and you're like, you know, I don't know why my family complains all the time, I'm never there. And then you look at it and you go, oh, yeah, so they like to have dinner together once a week. I do that oh, once every two months. Oh. What am I doing instead? You know, when you can start looking at how you're spending your time and how you might want to rebalance. I talked a little bit about the goals. You know, figure out your goals, your reality. That's the hard part. You know, it's like going on a diet. I don't weigh that much. Um, options. I didn't eat that much. And then you're like, oh my gosh, oh, all those cookies count? Um, <laughs> and then what are you going to do about it, right? And so that's, that's another tool that you can use. Um, and then what are my key learnings? Well, hopefully you've heard a lot of this through the presentation, but everybody has speed bumps. There are a lot of speed bumps in life. Your job, if you choose to accept it, is to keep rolling over them until you get past them. You know, and sometimes you'll have speed bumps. Like, you know, the first time you learn how to go over a speed bump when you're driving and you're like, oh, I don't know what this be. Oh, okay, I didn't get over it. Eh, let me roll over. Oh, I didn't get over it. Eh, you know, and life is like that sometimes. It's hard to get over some of these speed bumps, but just keep going. Um, and be inclusive and be kind and help others because, you know, we all have them. We all have stuff. Sometimes you can see it by looking at us. Sometimes you can't. But it's all in there. Um, the people you think are there to support you aren't always. Don't be paranoid, but don't be shocked. When I was at Center Reach High School, my physics teacher, after I won the Grauman Scholarship, I vividly remember this. Where, well, I had all these Kodak moments. I guess they're selfie moments now. But, you know, Kodak moments when we were growing up. And um, we were walking down the stairs, and he told me, he was disappointed that I won the Grumman Scholarship and not one of the guys. Here we go, puppy dog time. So what did I think? Oh, oh my gosh, maybe, maybe he's right. Why did I win it? And you start self-doubting. And then luckily I went, well, wait a second. It's their money and they picked me and they seem pretty smart. So I think they're right, right? But I still carry that with me. I'm still talking about it, you know, 40 years later. How ridiculous is that? Another story like this, there's a woman, I think it's Teresa Witherspoon. She was a, um, she was a basketball player. She's on the Olympic team. I don't know if any of you, she's incredible. We were on this Title IX panel with, um, with Hillary Clinton. Anyway, she was talking about when she was like in middle school, she had a coach tell her, you'll never be a good basketball player. She goes to high school, college. She's on the women's Olympic basketball team. They win a gold medal. What does she do when she gets home? This must be, what, 20 years after that, 15, 20 years? She takes her medal. She blows out the front door. She runs all the way to her coach's house. On his door, he opens it, and she goes, boom. <laughs> she was carrying that negativity her whole life. Oh, and she still made it all the way to the top. Wow. Don't let them do that to you. Put it in the garbage. It's very hard to do, but have people who love you that help you through that. You can be a threat in other people's minds. That's why we dumb ourselves down sometimes. They're just listening to me. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's me. Ah, you know, Melissa talks about me. You know, because people are threatened. Like, who do you think you are? I'm like, I don't think I'm anybody. But it doesn't matter. They still think you think who you are. I don't know what they think you think. <laughs> but but it's, it's an issue. You know, they're threatened by you. And so you have to figure out how to work that. And sometimes you just have to find another place to be. They're just not going to get over it. But do great thing. You have so many skills. So many unique little gifts you have. Use them, big gifts. Use them. So just don't stop. Don't let them stop you from everything. Follow your instincts. Your mother said, if it doesn't feel right, walk away. You know, she was right. Um, forgive, but don't forget. It took me a long time to forgive my real father. Probably uh, I was about 45 when I finally forgave him, but I never met him. But that's another story. Um, find your happy place, your comfort zone, where you recharge and go there. I golf. I go to the beach. I like wide open infinity space. I like infinity. I'm a scientist. Infinity. Oh, right. infinity and beyond. I love infinity. So I love the ocean where it's infinite. I love the sky because it's infinite. I love golfing. So that's where I find my comfort. Um, it's fun being a geek. And never give up on your dreams. Just never give up. Keep going. Make new dreams. How fun is that? So my last parting messages are, um, don't go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Oh, that's part of my goal with these talks, right? I made some new paths. You make some new paths. And you go do even better, even faster. I want you to win. Whatever you want to win, I want you to win. Go for it. 
And then this is something I actually found when my son was being diagnosed with asthma, and I was sitting there in my business suit. They called me from the, uh, the preschool, and, you know, he had a nebulizer on, and he thinks he's an astronaut. I'm crying, you know. And uh, there was a book on Ty Cobb. Who remembers who Ty Cobb is? History books. Yay! Oh, you, you are so good. So he was a very famous baseball player, and this was in his autobiography. A star is not something that flashes through the sky. It stays in place and gives off a strong, steady glow. Stars never take themselves for granted. That's why they're stars, right? So always remember that. Always try your hardest. Reach for the stars, and I know you can do it. Ta-da. Thank you.